Hello friends, welcome to this yet another episode of Indian Military Anecdotes. Friends, this time it, it's a special one. Today for the first time on our show, we have with us a naval officer who's going to narrate a very interesting anecdote to all of us. And he is Commander Anand Kulkarni. Commander Anand Kulkarni was commissioned in the Indian Navy in 1979. He belongs to the 54th NDA course. During the course of his service, he did the prestigious Staff College. He's been a missile and gunnery officer and specializes in anti-submarine warfare. Before taking premature retirement in 2003, he commanded two amphibious ships, a very prestigious job. After retirement from the Indian Navy, close to two decades, he also worked with, uh, with the Merchant Navy. So let's welcome Commander Anand Kulkarni. Welcome Commander Anand Kulkarni. Namaskar. Namaskar. Thank you, Aril. It's a, indeed a very special privilege for all of us to have you on the show, uh, being the first naval officer to narrate an uh, anecdote in this. A very, very special thanks to you. And now I'll request you to kindly go ahead and narrate your, the anecdote to all of us. My story starts on 1st January 1982. Uh -huh. I was promoted to the rank of a lieutenant, which, you know, is the equivalent of captain in the army. Captain in the army, yes. And, you know, I was appointed uh, some months prior in a missile boat as the missile gunnery officer. I see. So the name of the ship was INS Pratap. So I was in charge of uh, four surface-to-surface -surface missiles. I see. Uh, two anti-aircraft guns. I uh -huh. was also the navigating officer of the ship. And I was also the signal communication officer of the ship. Oh my God! But how many so uh, so many roles uh, uh, you know put into one, one gentleman? Uh, what happens is the missile boat is a very tiny boat, only hundred feet in length. I see. So it can't have too many officers and crew. No. So the, uh, everyone has to do uh, you know, three four jobs. Multiple roles. Multiple roles and huh. uh, so this was also the year 1982 was also the year of the Falklands War. Ah uh, yes. Oh yes. So I, I need to give you this background because, you know, that will help you to understand my story. Correct, correct. Now, as you know, the Falklands are an island about 900 miles from Argentina. Correct. And that is as much as the distance of Andaman Nicobar Island from uh, Vishakhapur. Indian, Indian shore, yeah. Yeah, Indian shore. And it is 9,000 miles away from Britain. Now, since uh, 1841, England had, uh, it was England's colony, Britain's colony. Correct. And, you know, Argentina kept uh, you know, constantly saying that, you know, this is near us, so it is our islands, you know. Right. And they were claiming uh, that to be a, a part of their territory, mm -hmm. which Britain refused because people of British descent were living on the islands and, uh, you know, they had their allegiance to the crown. Uh, meanwhile, in 1976, I think there was a military coup in Argentina and the military dictators took over the island. I see. Now, Argentina was quite a bad financial situation, right? bad economic situation. Right. And the military junta wanted to divert the attention from probably from the domestic affairs to elsewhere. Correct. So they started making you know, claims that you know, we must reclaim this uh, Falklands Islands by force if required. Okay. okay. So this went on for some time. And uh, by around 1980, I think that it was very clear that one day, they are going to take over by force. Correct. So the British also knew this and they were thinking that, you know, we can do nothing about it because, you know, Argentina is so far. Right. And uh, secretly the Americans, they had decided that uh, this is an impossible thing for Britain to take back the islands. Right. Because, you know, even if they can send the Navy there, from where will they bring shore-based aircraft? From where will they bring early warning aircraft? So all this was happening. Then finally, in uh, 1982, 2nd April 1982, Argentina invaded Falklands. Okay. And on 5th March 19, 5th April 1982, just three days after that, Margaret Thatcher ordered the Royal Naval Fleet to sail south towards Argentina. I see. No, nobody could believe that such a thing can happen. Ah, ah. Margaret so Thatcher was a uh, great lady. Yeah, it was a big force. Uh, it comprised of aircraft carriers, right. submarines, etc. And most notable among them was there were two carriers, the HMS Invincible and the HMS Service. 
I see. And uh, as a little bit aside, I will tell you that after the war, HMS Herbis was mothballed and she joined the Indian Navy in 1987 as INS Virat. Oh, the same ship? The same ship, yeah. I see. Yeah. So the Hermes, the invincible. Very, very, very interesting facts, yeah. otherwise not known to most people. Uh, then the nuclear part submarine, HMS Conquest, and you know, many other ships they sailed. Right. And you know, the world was amazed, and so was I. You know, I am a military buff, so I was, you know, hearing this war all on my transistor radio right, in the right. command mess and on the ship. Right. And you know, the British had even uh, put a Correspondent on board the Hermes. I see. And incidentally, as one more aside, uh, Prince Andrew was a helicopter pilot on the Hermes. Mm -hmm. So he was flying the seeking helicopter. I see. So when all these ships sailed, but you know, you require troops on the ground. So Correct. The uh, Britain, they commandeer two passenger uh, liners. I think one was the Canberra and the QE2. So on the Canberra, they sent the commando brigade of the of the British Army, and they sent an infantry brigade in the QE2. I see. Uh, then the Britain even did some uh, interesting things, like you know, the Harrier aircraft can take off vertically. So they sent some container ships so the uh, her, uh, the Harrier could take off even from or land on the uh, containers. Oh, okay. So, so, some such improvisations they did. I see. This entire task force, they uh, sailed for the uh, Falkland Islands. I see. Now the question came of from where they will they get the shore-based aircraft? So, Britain, they had another colony called the Ascension Islands. I see. So, you, I would say that is a, maybe halfway between Argentina and Britain. Right. So, they had a, they made an airfield over there. And from there, their uh, aircraft like the Nimrod, which is a you know a long range patrol aircraft, I and see. big aircraft could take off from there. Right. And uh, they also arranged in such a way that uh, their fighter aircraft could be uh, refueled on the way by tankers. Okay. So literally, a big armada was coming towards the uh, Falkland, which was very very interesting for us. Right. And uh, after that, Britain declared. Uh, it is an illegal thing, but they declared a 200 miles maritime exclusion zone around the Falkland, Falkland Islands. Oh, I see. Okay. What they meant by this was that if any Argentinian ship or aircraft is found in this, they are liable to be attacked. Correct. And as the days progressed from maritime exclusion zone, they made it to a total exclusion zone. I see. Total exclusion zone means forget about Argentina, any ship or aircraft, Anyone, yeah. any other okay. country, if they are found. Correct. They are liable to be attacked. This is like their own territory. Yeah. Why this? they were doing this is because in the Argentinian aircraft, uh, Air Force, they had Boeing aircraft. And this Boeing aircraft were also shadowing the British fleet as they came towards the islands. I see. Now, just see, it is so difficult for the British fighting a war from thousands of miles away. Correct. Uh, whereas the Argentinian aircraft could take off, you know, from the Argentinian mainland and fly towards the Falklands and carry out their attack and go back. Correct. Now, the Argentinian uh, super attendant aircraft, they were equipped with Exocet missile. I see. The Exocet is a, a French missile, and it is a very low fly. Right. And after the war started... The, Not detectable easily. Yeah, because it will just skim over the waves and come. Oh, right, right. So, by the time you detect the missile, it has already hit you. Oh. Yeah. So, what happened was, uh, the first casualty was HMS Sheffield, a frigate. Mm. Uh, so she was victim to an Exocet missile fired by an Argentinian Air Force super attendant aircraft. I see. Now, because of the way the British ships were built, their superstructure and all, she burned furiously and you know went down. I see. Now there has to be a reprisal. So I think the next casualty of the war was the Argentinian cruiser General Belgrano. Mm-hmm. The submarine HMS Conquest interestingly fired two, three torpedoes on the General Belgrano. Right. She fired first the modern torpedoes, which failed. But the World War II vintage torpedo hit the Belgrano. Oh. I hit and General Belgrano sank with, you know, 800 sailors and many officers, maybe oh 20, 30 or. Oh, I see. Okay. And, you know, there was a, a bit of problem because 
uh, Argentina claimed that the general background no, was outside the explosion zone. Okay. Uh, but then in war, you know, such things do happen. <laughs> and, you know, I, I was most intently, you know, hearing, uh, I mean, I was glued to my transistor all the time right. for the BBC radio to you know, get updates about this war. Right, right. And you know, the correspondence from the Hermes was also speaking. Right. So it was, you know, truly fantastic. And most amazing is, you know, how uh, 8,000 or 9,000 miles away Britain was fighting. Yeah, them. absolutely. Very, very amazing. Yeah. And now, well, all, all this come, was happening. So I'll come to my story now. Yeah. Now, what happened was I had, after passing out from India in 1978, I was commissioned in 1979. And from that time, I was hearing that ships from Vishakapatnam in India are going for patrol to an island in the Bay of Bengal called the New Moor Island. I see. Now, what that uh, island was, it was a disputed island. It fell in the territories of, I mean, fell in a common area between India and Bangladesh. Okay. Now, the patrol was a, you know, it was a grueling patrol, means you had to go there hang around for three months or two months, then you will not get your provisions, water, etc. Mm. So, but the Bangladesh naval ships would also come there and the Indian and Bangladesh ships would stand you know, eyeball to eyeball and challenge each other. Oh. That this is my territory and this is my territory. Right, right. Now you may wonder if an island, hai to, why it is not clear that it is an island? Yeah. So, iska, the answer is this. That there was a cyclone in 1970 called Cyclone Bhola. In 1970? 1970. And this island suddenly surfaced. Oh, I see. Uh, this island was at the mouth of two rivers. Uh, that is Ichamati and Harbanga. Right. And uh, it is adjacent to the districts of 24 Parganas and one more uh, district in Bangladesh. Oh, right. Uh, so then now this island was never there. Now it is there. So everybody can claim it as mine, you know. So Bangladesh was claiming it as ours. Uh, now what happens is because of the uh, global warming and all, sea sea water sea level is going down. Correct. So that is how this island surfaced. Island surfaced. Uh, now this island, you'll be surprised. It is only two thousand five hundred square meters. Okay. It is a very tiny island. Tiny. Nobody can live on that, and nobody lived on it. Right. But it was uh, you know expected that there would be oil and gas or some minerals over there. I see. So that is why these territorial claims are going on. And after the 1973 Arab-Israeli war, the prices of oil shot up. Correct. And, you know, people started, you know, exploring you know, the sea for oil. So naturally, the 19, uh, late 1970s, this island became very important. Right. Uh, so <clears throat> coming back to my story of what was happening to me, I was in this missile boat. So one day, one fine day from the command mess, I came to the ship and I, surprised, I found a few trucks standing out of my ship. Oh. <laughs> I said, what is this? So they said, These are missiles for loading. Combat okay. missiles. Okay. Then after some time, some more trucks came and they said, we have to take your practice anti-aircraft ammunition and we will give you war ammunition. Achha. I asked CEO, I said, sir, what is happening? Yeah. So, and we have not demanded anything. <laughs> Normally, Navy, you have to put in a demand. Yeah, obviously, and yes. Then they will give. Yes. And for loading missiles, you have to go to a jetty called the missile loading jetty. Achha, there's a separate jetty for that. Uh, and uh, one of the jetties is a few miles away also. Oh, I see. But here they were giving us everything. And it was not that, you know, some storekeepers and all of them. Some officers would come along with, were coming along with this and they were briefing me. Okay, this is the missile, this is the fuse, sign these documents. Then <laughs> after, as the day went on, trucks with ration also came. I was still wondering, okay, then afternoon, one commander from the Naval Chart Depot came and he said, just see if you've got charts of Bangladesh. <laughs> and you know, then the bulb lit up in my brain. I said, we are going to New Moor Island. I see. Then there was a newly uh, you know, formed organization called the Warship Workup Organization. That office was near my ship. Its officer in charge was one a very dashing commander, Johnny De Silva, who later on became a rear admiral. 
I see. So he came to my ship and he called all the crew and gave us a lecture. And he's telling me, don't go down like the Sheffield. <laughs> it's not the right thing to say, right? <laughs> so you know, I, I just remembered that the Sheffield went down with the Exocet missile. Right, right. And you know, uh, things were you know loading, showing some charata. After some time, I saw a flag car drive up to the jetty, and our commander in chief, Vice Admiral Lama Awati, had come. Oh, I see. And you know, his total English, English he told, uh, Hindi he told. Tum log ladhai mein jar raha hai. <laughs> and it was quite well. I was pretty excited. Then uh, the ship was to sail out in the evening and we loaded the four war missiles. And normally when you have war missiles, they, each missile carries 400 kg of TNT. Oh, that's... And for the first time I saw what a mechanical fuse is. Oh. You know, because practice missile, there is no fuse. Right. So fuses were issued. And then, you know, the our squadron commander, our squadron, by the way, was called the 25 Killer Squadron. It is the same squad which had Karachi burning on 4 December 1971. Oh, okay, okay. So our squad commander, our Commodore Kurana, he came and addressed us, and I said, you know, go at you know full speed. You know, our uh, the boat had three engines. I see. Each engine could do maximum of 1900 RPM. So we decided we'll sail at slightly less 1700. I see. So that would give us a speed of 20 knots, which is very high. Which is pretty high. Yeah. yeah so you like literally fly at that speed. Yeah, almost. So we uh, sailed out from Mumbai and in, within 17 hours we were in Cochin because the boat was small, you know, you require refueling. Right. So rations. We went to Cochin, took on the fuel, took on the rations. And from Cochin, we had to sail around Madras, uh, around the uh, Sri Lanka to reach Madras. Correct. So that was a two-day sailing at top speed. We did that, came to Madras. In Madras, our uh, squadron commander, Commodore Kurana, was there again. He gave us a pep talk. There are two boats. That is my boat, INS Pratap. And second boat was INS Chamak. Right. So he gave us a lecture and says, go to Newbar Island and show the Bangladeshis, whatever. Uh, but he said, only thing is, now we are going from Madras to Vesakapattam. Sail full speed, and there was some uh, so some dangerous navigational place called the Sacramento Shoals. I see. That keep clear of that, you know, because he was a navigator; he knew it very well. I see. So we again took fuel rations from Madras and sailed at top speed to Vishakhapatnam. I see. So when we reached Vishakhapatnam, I thought now next order will be proceed to Newmar Island. You get it. But I understand, meanwhile, what had happened was the Bangladeshi government got a wind that Indian Navy has dispatched two powerful missile boats over here. I see. So at government level, they had some talks. They decided that no more they will do this patrolling and belligerent posing around the island, but they'll go to the International Court for Arbitration. I see. So it was such an anti-climax. We went to Vishakhapatnam. <laughs> And we were told, stand down. Now you have to join the Eastern. And you actually Eastern. went anticipating a lot of action. <laughs> yeah, and nothing happened. <laughs> and nothing happened. <laughs> but all the time I was carrying all these war missiles on board. Now, the story is, little, we'll go a little further in the story. Uh, petroleum was stopped. Life went on normal. And in 2010, the island went underwater again. How? Oh, really? Oh, my yes. God. As of today, it is submerged. As of today, that doesn't exist. I mean, it's submerged. It doesn't exist, yeah. But in 2014, the International Court of Arbitration, they gave a ruling favoring India. And they said it is, Bangladesh cannot appeal against that. So, to give you more information, all these islands, uh, economic zone, exclusive economic zone, territorial waters, and all these is governed right. by uh, something called the United Nations Convention on the Law of Seas. I see. Okay. So, as per that, the ruling was given in uh, favor of India. I see. So, uh, that is my you know, anecdote. This is, you can say, a powerful message to Bangladesh that what India can do and right. everybody stood down. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, there are a couple of things as I have understood. One was that you uh, very uh, aptly brought in the history of Falkland War 
and uh, brought out how Navy can operate almost 10,000 kilometers away so very yeah. effectively. Yes. I think, uh, and basis that you also brought out this operation which you were set out for, for the Moore Island. This was again a very long distance as far as you were concerned. Yeah, that's right. See, from Mumbai to Vishakhapatnam itself is 1,000 uh, Absolutely. Kilometers. Yeah, absolutely. And from Vishakhapatnam to New Moore Island, if you had to go, it is again, you know, a few hundred kilometers at least. So, absolutely. you can see that how at just one day's notice, a naval yeah. project, power can be projected are 1,000 kilometers away. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is absolutely praiseworthy. So, thank you very much. It's been a great story. And uh, I'm sure our viewers are going to appreciate uh, even the, uh, when I see when the stories are these kind uh, are narrated, it is not only the civilians who get educated or knowledgeable about the military matters, but stories mm -hmm. like yours, I'm sure some of the naval youngsters would also will appreciate what did the uh, British Navy do during the Falkland War. So yes, all this is uh, very interesting. And thank you very much, Commander uh, Anand, uh, for being on our show. And we hope to li listen to more and more stories from you in the future. And we also hope that, you know, you would be the leading light for so many more naval officers to come and join us on this program. So thank you very much and all the very best. Thanks a lot. Thank you.